I'm so happy to be here. It's a very special privilege. I don't know if we are the most uh, famous in the world, but we put out the most material. So maybe that's our special uh, place in the world is we talk a lot and we research a lot about the internet. Pew, or Pew, is a family name in the United States. Mr. Pew, in the 1880s and 1890s, discovered oil in Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania, and he dug it out of the ground, and he shipped it all around the world, and he made a lot of money. He, it's the same era as the Rockefellers, and the same era as the Carnegies and other great American fortunes. When his children inherited the money, they decided to create a big U.S. charity that was to help communities. It's in Philadelphia. It's in Pennsylvania. And they helped the community with libraries and with museums and with other projects. But they also, um, starting about 20 years ago, began to support research about a lot of different topics. And one of the topics that they thought would be really interesting and really important for Pew to make a contribution to the world was about the role of technology in people's lives. So they asked me, I was a journalist, as you may have heard, and I was an editor at a magazine at the time that I got a phone call from the Pews, and they said, would you like to run this research center? And I said, what an amazing, fabulous idea. Where are the problems? Because it was described so smartly that I said, there must be something to be worried about in this, in this enterprise. And they said, no, there's no... There's no, nothing to worry about. And they also said, we do not want you to change the world. We're not giving you money to try to make the world a better place or to have the internet be a better internet. There's no Pew policy on net neutrality. We don't say Microsoft is better than Google or Facebook is better than MySpace. We don't have any agenda driving our work. There's nothing doing it other than to ask interesting questions and to try to get the answers to those questions about the social impact of the internet. So we don't really care that much about business, but we care about families and communities and healthcare and politics and workplaces and that's where we do our research. And the research that we do is mostly the statistics that I will give you is from big national American phone surveys, telephone surveys, where we call people up on the telephone randomly and we ask them, and it's representative of the entire adult population of the United States, and we ask them questions about do you use the internet, do you have a tablet computer, do you use Facebook, we ask a lot of questions about their internet use, do you use the internet for health, for politics. And then we report the findings based on these samples. So we are talking about the entire United States population based on these random representative surveys. Some of the data that I won't discuss here, but some of the data that we gather comes from online surveys. But we don't ever report the statistics of that because in America, there are not yet good representative samples of the general population or even the internet population. So we think phone surveys are the better way to get accurate stories, but we use web surveys to talk to specific populations of people. So teenagers, it's a really good way to talk to teenagers, or people who have specific kinds of health problems or health conditions, or people who use libraries a lot. And we use those surveys to, uh, as qualitative understanding. So we ask people to tell us about their internet use and their cell phone use. And we ask them to explain what they're doing and why they're doing it. So a lot of what maybe I will answer questions of yours by talking about 
the interviews that we accomplish um, online, but we don't report any statistics from an online panel. We, these are just national surveys. And surveys in America, probably like surveys in Israel, are harder to do these days. 25 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, it was very simple to do a survey. Most people would answer their phone and talk to you. Most people had a landline, a wired telephone in their house, right? Not anymore. People in America especially um, hate telemarketers, people who call and try to sell them things over the telephone. So they don't answer their phone as much. They also now have caller identification on their phone. So they know if the person who's calling them is a friend or is a company. And they um, are also now harder to reach because lots of Americans do not have a landline telephone anymore, a wired telephone. They are wireless. And so it's a little bit more difficult to reach them in our phone survey. So now that most of our recent data, most of our recent surveys are 50%. Half of them are on landlines and half of them are on cell phones. And we have been increasing the proportion of cell phone completed interviews because in many respects that's the only way that we can talk to young adults. They don't have telephones in their home. It's a way that in America that we can talk to African Americans and Latinos, the minority populations in the United States. And the poor populations in the United States are much more likely just to have a cell phone, I mean, and not a landline phone. So this is, um, th this is an increasingly important part of our work, is to try to find people on their cell phones and to ask them questions. And it's, it's harder to keep them on the telephone for 20 minutes. Our normal survey is about 20 minutes long, and it's just harder to talk to them because they have things that they want to do. So maybe I'll just stop right there to make sure that you all kind of understand the basic methods that I will be describing. Are you okay? And please interrupt me with any questions anytime. I'm, I'm happy to, I studied the internet. It's all about people talking to each other and I would much rather do that than lecture to you. Uh, I'd rather answer your questions. And so for 13 years now, we have been studying the social impact of the internet digital um, information on people. And we've begun to develop a very rich picture about how in information has changed. When it became digitized, information took on new character and had new meaning and could be reproduced and created in brand new ways. So the very nature of information, how we learn things from each other, has been changing. And so these are some of the sort of big changes that we see um, in our data. First of all, information is pervasively generated. Everyone can now become a publisher or a broadcaster or a news person and take a picture or shoot a video and share it. So the process of creating and sharing information is a constant thing for the most interested internet users. It's pervasively consumed. Now that we walk around with our mobile devices, right, we can get information whenever we want, wherever we are, as long as that device is connected to the internet. Information is a lot more personal than it used to be. If you think of the pre-internet era as, as industrial media, and you think of post-internet as information age, in the industrial age, Media companies gave you information. They're big, expensive companies that paid a lot of people to gather up information and make sense of it and then sell it to you. Now, all of a sudden, the people can become their own information creators and information nodes. And so they are changing the way that they filter information. It's not just coming from media companies to to them, it's coming from their friends, it's coming from their networks, it's coming from all different um, sort of points on the spectrum. Information is participatory now. It used to be that in industrial media, we consumed information. We lean back and we watch TV, 
or we lean back when we read a book or a magazine. Well, now we lean forward. We are participating. In many cases, people take information that they have learned or that they have encountered, and they pass it along, and they comment on it. And so information is not just a passive consumption activity anymore. It's a participatory action. Information can be linked. The most magical thing about the internet is that information can be connected to other information. It's continually edited. If you think back to industrial media, the editing process was a very important one, right? You would gather information, and someone else would check it, and editors would judge, make judgments about it, and they would change it all up, they would mark it all up. <clears throat> and then it would publish, and that was the end of the story. The publication moment was the end of the story. You could complain about it, but you wouldn't get very far. And you could maybe comment to your friends about it, but you couldn't share it with lots and lots of other people. <clears throat> well, now, in the internet era, <clears throat> with digital information, information's edited all the time. When it's published, people comment on it. When it's published, people have their own reactions to it. When it's published, they talk to their friends or they talk back to the original publisher about it. So the editing process is not a simple one anymore. It's a continual one. It comes in many platforms. Of course, we all carry around all kinds of devices that, that share information with us. In the mobile environment, it's real time. It comes at you as it's being generated, or it's just in time so that you can search for it whenever you care about it. You're not dependent on a media company to give you a newspaper in the morning and give you, or give you a newscast in the evening, or to tell you, like you turn on the radio at, at the beginning of the hour, what the latest news is. Now you can get information whenever you want. And so a big change in our relationship to media is that people themselves are in charge of their own experiences of media and this mobile environment really helps that. At the same time it's immediate and it's, and it's just in time, it also it mean, information is a lot more timeless than it used to be. It sticks around. You can find it years after the fact. It's easy to search years after the fact. So it collapses in real time, but it expands in timelessness. So then now lots of information that I'm sure this has happened to people in this room. Things that you said 15 years ago or 20 years ago are still easy to find by people who are searching for them. Very different from the environment where we uh, didn't have the capacity to search it the way we used to. And information is defined by both social networks and algorithms, right? If you think of search engines, right? They're the ones that arrange information sort of mechanically for you. So lots of the meaning of information now is being established by machines. It's not by human editors. It's not by human um, uh, um, overseers or gatekeepers. Machines are helping sort through what information is most relevant. So there are a whole lots of ways now that information is different from what it used to be and it's changed the way that we experience it. So in, in, our, in my book, where I talked about um, the, the networked organization and networked individuals, right? We all live in networks now and a big thought in the book that I wrote last year was that people have moved from a social environment that was mostly defined by tight-knit groups, really tight, you know, your family, your village, your small working community, into bigger, broader, more far-flung networks. So instead of tight groups, we're in big networks now. And this, all of these changes have been encouraged by three big technology revolutions. Um, and I hope you'll hear the Israeli story about these data uh, in the presentation that comes up next. So it, these are American data always, okay? Um, the first revolution is the internet broadband revolution. When we did our first survey in the year 2000, 46% of American adults used the internet. So we came actually at the midway of the story, but hardly anyone had broadband at home. 
there's hardly anybody, when we did our first surveys, there are a very small number of people, 4%, had broadband at home in America. Now it's 68%. So over 13 years, it's gone from almost nothing to two-thirds of the population now has broadband. Now, as we watched people move from the dial-up environment, very slow, very clunky, very, not very friendly environment, right, to broadband where it's much more high speed, always on, always available, a lot of things changed about the way people use the internet. They did more things, their internet activity spread out. So they, they, if they used to read a newspaper, now they go to online news sources. If they used to use cookbooks, now they use online recipe sites. And so there are ways, as people moved to the, um, to the broadband environment, they changed the rhythms of their information acquisition, and they privileged the internet over other sources. But the most, and they spent more, much more time online too, but the most important thing that happened is they became content creators. These are the ways that we measure content creation in our, in our surveys. And if you add up people who said yes to at least one of these things, you would see that two-thirds of adults and about three-quarters of teenagers in America are content creators. So they're telling their story, they're ranking things, they're rating things, they're criticizing things. The, the power of the internet is giving all of these new people the chance to tell their stories and the chance for them to share what they know. Now sometimes, as a matter of fact, most of the time, what they have to say is not very interesting, except maybe to them and the two people who love them. But most of the time, it's not big, profound media changes. It's, it's personal things. But it's really democratized media. When all of these new people became media creators and all of these new people began to share what they know and tell their own stories, they became contributors to the media ecosystem. And, and so on, on this list, you know, social networks are at the top of the list, social networking sites. These are of internet users. So 69% of internet users in America are social network site users. A lot of them share photos. And they not only share photos that they themselves take, but they look online among their friends and YouTube videos and things like that and share those videos. They embed them in their Facebook pages or they put them in their blogs or things like that. So curation, you know, sharing what you find is a big part of the social story about how people are using these media. Then they contribute things and they rank and they rate. Twitter is not very big. There's a lot of attention, especially in America, about the importance and power of Twitter. And it is important and powerful, but it's not because lots of people do it. Not as many people do it. There are about one-sixth of the number who use Facebook. But what's important about Twitter, especially, I guess this is probably true here too, these people are influencers. The people who use Twitter care about their communities, care about media, care about civic life, and so they are talking a lot about local politics or local activities in their community, and they are adding to the voices in the community, and they have audiences. They have people who follow them, right? And so Twitter is not important for the big size of the population, but it's important because lots of the people who use it are influencers. They are determined to tell their stories and have their reactions matter in their communities. Bloggers are still around. It's, again, not a very big population, but it's a lot of blogging things are now happening in Facebook. People don't think of that as blogging. They think of that as filling their news feed. So there are lots of ways that, that blogging activity gets on there. And then these final things are location services. Guala and Foursquare here are the location, yeah. So, uh, a fifth of smartphone users in the United States are che uh, use check-in services like Gowala and Foursquare. They, they say, here I am, and their friends come to see them, or the local businesses give them a little deal in, in, in for being in the neighborhood or something like that. And even more so, of course, people use the map functions in their mobile devices to figure out where they are and to navigate um, through the world. So 
so all of this media creation has changed, as I say, the character of media space. Yeah? What is the size of the group that you were checking? Did you check also the changes in between, you know, taking a research that poll in 2010 and 2013? Yes. Uh, th th these are all data from late 2012. And, and we've started asking about content creation in 2002 when we first started asking about blogs. So we added blogs in 2002 and then asked a, a number of questions over the years about blogs. We added um, social networking sites in 2005 and every year we ask about that. So these are data that are updated when new things happen. One of the, uh, and so we started asking in America now for the very first time in the past two months about Pinterest and Tumblr and Instagram and things like that. So we're always yeah, adding to our... I was, I was wondering about the changes oh, yeah. in the research. And yeah. also what is the size of the group that you were checking on? Um, well, we're, these are big national, nationally representative surveys. So the, the, our poll sizes are about 2,200 people, but they are meant to represent all adults, all, all 18, age 18 and older. And, and so in 2005, I'll ha actually have data in a later slide, about 5% of internet users were using social network sites. Now it's 69%. So, that, so the, the, there are big changes that are that have been interesting to watch because as more people start using the sites, it changes the conversation that happens on those sites. You know, the early adopters are very different people from the people who come later on in the adoption curve. And uh, actually, I'll, I'll do a lot more talking about that in about five minutes. Uh, but that's a great question. Are there other questions about how we're capturing this stuff? Okay, the, the other thing, well, uh, I'll actually do this in a minute too. So there are big impacts at the rise of broadband by making all of this content creation possible has changed civic spaces and changed the way people participate in politics and other things and changed just their, their social relations. Uh, at the top of the list, um, I would argue that the people who actively use social media are a fifth estate. If you remember your French history a little bit, in the... 16th, 17th, 18th century, the first estate was the clergy, right? Second estate was the nobility, and the third estate was the peasants, right? In the beginning of the 20th century, first in America and Great Britain, and then throughout the developed world, came a fourth estate, the press. So it, the reason for saying that's sort of different from those other three estates is they had a very different role in civic life. Once the, the basic... Um, ideas in the, in the developed world, America and, and Great Britain especially, once they understood that reporters function in a very different way in civic life from active citizens, right? The reporters are supposed to be a little bit disengaged from c civic life. They're supposed to tell multiple sides of a story. They're not supposed to be in, um, in, in a partisan camp or supporting partisan groups. In, in some of these countries. And so they had a very different relationship to public life from those other estates. And now the social media crowd is a fifth estate because they yet again have a very different relationship to civic life, right? They don't want to be dispassionate about it. They don't want to have an arm's length relationship with civic life. The whole reason they use social media to talk about things is because they care about it. They're passionate. They're personal, they've got a team that they're rooting for, so they're very partisan. So their contributions are, are come in a very different atmosphere from the contributions of the fourth estate, right? So they cover different things. I mean, there's just very clear evidence here and in America that the agenda, the news agenda of the social media activists and the traditional news media is very different. They cover different subjects. And they cover different things, they cover di the same subject in very different ways. So this has had an enormous impact, for instance, on news. It's changed the definition of news. There are a lot more things that get covered now because people are talking about them in social media, right? I just heard about the episode over the weekend at, um, at that uh, bread and breakfast in, in, uh, in northern Israel where the, the owner of the, of the local inn didn't like what, the, what some patrons had done. And, and so posted on Facebook about it, and all of a sudden that's become a big story, right? It's, it's been covered by the mainstream press in Israel, and there are just you know, stories every day, I'm sure, that are being covered here that would not have been covered 
if they hadn't become very popular subjects in, uh, in social media. So the, the, you know, the very definition of what is important for a culture to watch is being changed by these new actors. It means that we argue about a lot more things now than we used to. In the, in the age of industrial media, all those gatekeeper editors, they defined what was important and what was for, useful for us to talk about and what was, what was the right framework for those discussions. Well, now when lots more people are contributing to the media, we argue about a lot more things. There are just more subjects that we are clashing over, right? For organizations, it's really hard for them to control the messages that they put out into the world, right? Because everybody wants to talk about them. And messaging context uh, uh, would, would, would make sense. You know, is anybody tweeting while well, we're going through here? Yeah, so there's a tweet. So I'm talking to you guys. I can see you. You can see me. That's the context I'm thinking that this exchange is, is occurring in, right? He's tweeting to his audience. Now, he could pick anything that I'm saying and, and say, this guy from America said this, right? So his audience isn't in this room, and they have a potentially very different understanding of what's going on here than you and I have by being here. And if someone discovers his tweets tomorrow or next Thursday, you know, what, was, what we were doing on a Sunday, all of a sudden that context gets changed by these media letting people sort of consume uh, when they want. So messaging gets all messed up um, when it's taken out of the context in which it, it's originally done. Yeah? You can also lie about what you're saying. Yeah, that's it. Well, there's, there's always that. Yeah, you can lie and then, you know, I have to do some cleanup after that and mm -hmm. maybe the lie is louder and more believable than my, my repair job on myself and stuff like that. Or so, I ruin my credibility. That, that's right. So, that, so all of a sudden something that, you know, feels pretty intimate, right? And we're having a little discussion in a room here. All of a sudden it can take on a very, very public character that calls into question who I am and what I'm saying or calls into question what somebody else said about me and stuff. So this is, this is a way it's become very disorienting uh, to kind of live in this environment. Now if you take our, the data that I showed before about internet, there are lots of ways of course that people uh, are using different functions of the internet and, and these are some of the digital divides that we see in the American data. I'm sure there are parallels here in Israel. Um, if you're older, you're less likely to use the internet, right? And in America now, the big, big drop-off is around age 71. So lots of older people are using the internet, it's very popular, but after about age 71, there's a, there's a big drop-off. Income still matters a lot. If you are in a household in America that's relatively poor, you're about half as likely to use the internet as a well-off household. Education matters a lot. As a matter of fact, it matters more than income as an independent statistical predictor of internet use. If you have a limited ed education in America, you're much less likely to use the internet than if you're highly educated. Uh, especially in the context of broadband, if you live in a remote area or a rural area of America, you're less likely to, have, to be one of those two-thirds of Americans that, that use broadband. A lot of that is infrastructure problems. It's just much more expensive to build the, you know, the material out to, to remote areas, and so the companies don't have as much incentive to do that, so that's a big um, influence on that story. We do our surveys in America in English and in Spanish. About 14% of the American uh, population is Latino now, and about 5% prefer to speak um, Spanish at home. So when we call you on the phone to participate in our interviews, we ask, do you want to talk to us in English or do you want to talk in Spanish? The people who choose Spanish are less likely to use the internet. They're, they tend to be poorer, um, but e language itself is an independent predictor in America of whether you use the internet. If you're not comfortable with English to do a telephone interview, you're less likely to use the internet. And then disability and chronic illness are also independent predictors. Those are also tend to be poorer people and older people, but if you've got a serious disability, e even if you have a relatively high income, you're slightly less likely to be using the internet. And of course, be, people use the internet in different ways. I mean, there and that, a lot of that is very familiar stuff that comes out of media studies that predate the internet. Women are much, much more likely to seek health information online than men are.
women have always been the caregivers and gatekeepers of their families and their households for medical information. So in the printed era, that was true. And in the internet era, it's true. Men are more into news than women are. That's always been mostly the case. And so in the internet uh, environment, that's, that's still the case. Women are much more likely to use social tools. They were the, the most avid email users, still are. And they're much more likely to be you know, active in all sorts of social media platforms. Um, than men are. Men are into sports. Okay, so there are you know there are very different ways that even uh, with these broad tools, people have different media diets and have different media interests that they filter for. Okay, so that's revolution number one is broadband and internet. Revolution number two is mobile. Right now, 89% of American adults and more than half of American adults have smartphones. So you know almost nine in ten have a cell phone. And almost half have a, a smartphone. These are data about the millions of mobile um, subscriptions in America. So in 2010, there are 302.9 million mobile subscriptions. In 2012, there are 321.7 mobile subscriptions. That's more than the number of humans there are in the United States. And actually, the United States is one of the lagging countries in this. There are 100 countries. 100 countries where there are more mobile subscriptions than there are bodies. Israel is probably way high. Um, and, and you guys are all a big part of the problem, right? You've got a smartphone, you've got a tablet, you've got a wireless internet device and stuff. So you're walking around with about... Israel is like this before the era of smartphones. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, Israel has always been... More than seven years yeah. that uh, we have more uh, methods than people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, and it just speaks to how hyper-connected we are. And sometimes people try to, to segment their lives by this. They have a work phone and a, and a home phone, or they have a phone that they use only for certain friends and another phone for other friends. And so there are ways now that people are trying to be strategic about how they communicate and, and which device um, they use. Yeah, 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 exactly. And a big part of the mobile culture, of course, is the rise of apps. More than half of Americans have an app on one of the mobile devices in their life. And these are, they've actually taken the extra step of downloading an app. So this year when we do this survey, it'll be more than half of Americans will have apps in their life. And for your purposes, one of the most interesting and, and um, difficult things to do is to figure out um, how people are changing when they bring apps into their life. because. The, 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 their search strategies and their news consumption strategies in the wide, World Wide Web were very different from when they download the app of their favorite news organization. You know, in the app environment, they have a very specific relationship with a specific institution. They trust the institution. They want to make sure they get the best information from that institution. On the web, you know, in the wired web, it was, it was more indiscriminate. They didn't quite care as much where information came from as long as that was useful to them. They weren't necessarily being very careful about did it come from a big reputable news company or did it come from a blogger. So this apps environment is also changing the way that people uh, think about information and get information. Um, the impact of the rise of mobile connectivity is, as I said before, information becomes pervasive. There's another sort of wonderful French notion uh, that has come into the world where it talks about information now is so pervasive it's like a third skin for us, right? The first skin is our real skin, the second skin is our clothes, the third skin is the data that just swirls around us and is available to all of us who have a mobile device in our hand. And again, it very different when you can access whatever you want wherever you are as long as you've got one of these devices. Really changes people's attention allocation, right? Um, some of the most prominent commentary about this talks about multitasking, right? Everybody lives with multiple screens on and multiple devices on. Uh, there's a wonderful American notion that, that um, certainly applies to uh, life here. Um, that takes multitasking and says, really, the thing that, that's disorienting about it and stressful about it is that we live in a state of continuous partial attention. We're always having to watch all of our screens and all of our clients and all of our emails and all of our texts because you never can tell when an important intervening piece of information is going to come in. 
So you can't shut off, right? You can't shut your smartphone off. You can't stop texting. You can't set your email buzzer or beeper not to go off because your boss might need you or your family might need you or your best friend might be going to the best bar in town and you don't want to miss that, right? And so in America, uh, one of the wonderful new acronyms about life in this era is FOMO, F-O-M-O. It stands for fear of missing out, which is why we keep all our devices on, right? Because we don't want to be the last to know when something crazy happens or something important happens. And if you think about the young people in your lives, most of you are young people in your you know, you don't want to not know what your friends are doing and don't want to not be plugged in uh, to their worlds. Okay, so that's one part of attention. The second part is that, yes, we can be multitaskers, but also if something really, really, really matters to us. This is an unbelievably wonderful environment to get to the bottom of it. So if something all of a sudden becomes really important for you to know, this is an environment where you can get to the bottom of it. The way this shows up most dramatically in our research is how people do health searches. You know, if, if they've just been diagnosed, or if a loved one has just been diagnosed, they might not have known anything about that medical condition and the medicine to treat it and where the best hospitals were. They might not have known anything the day before the diagnosis. The day after the diagnosis, they want everything that's possible to know about What's going on with me? What's going to happen to me? What are the best medicines for me to take? What are the side effects of those medicines? How am I going to live my life with this stuff? So all of a sudden, when you need some kind of information, and it's not just health information, if something just turns you on, you can dig to the very bottom of it and get the exact same high quality expert information that the most credentialed important people who are experts in the field can get, right? So it's again, it's very disorienting, but you can get to the bottom of things, and a amateurs now sit next to experts as contributors to knowledge and learning and, and information. Then the final way that, uh, yeah, yeah. But this, is not, this is too much information. Yes, there's, too yes. The, the big disadvantage of this is information overload. There's just too much stuff coming in, and sometimes it's really hard to find the most useful, important information because there's, it's pervasive, right? Or, or yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. The biggest mistake the the status of the authority, authority in medicine, in my field of authority of religion, uh, of the religion, uh, in terms of, of sort of mediating the information, telling you there's so much information, here I'll help you. Yes. And lots of institutions have taken on that role now where they understand that the biggest challenge for people is not getting new information that I generate, but it's, it's helping sort through all of the conflicting information. And in a social environment where so much media is social, um, they are acting like good friends. They're acting like nodes in people's social networks because they know that people are struggling to find the right information. So it's a really new an interesting role for institutions to play is I'm not just going to be the all-wise health authority or news authority or something like that. I'm going to actually help you navigate to the best stuff. And it's a very, it's a very different kind of way of thinking about your relationship with your customers when you are essentially holding their hand as opposed to, you know, telling them what what ought to be. Um, Curate there is it, it's a really powerful role now that well, it, um, that that companies as but as well as smart individuals are playing. I'm sure you guys, because you're experts and authorities, your friends help, want you to help them navigate to the most important industry news that you're in, or the most important academic news, or the most important news news. And so this new role that we're now playing with our friends of curating stuff, not just being the authority on everything, but saying, Here, here's a good place to rely on, or here's something new that I think you'll be interested in. It's an enormously important role uh, now in this world. And the final uh, challenge to information is what I call information snacking, right? Because when we have these mobile devices with us every hour of the day, we never have to be bored again, right? Yeah. You can, if you've got five minutes, you're waiting for someone, you're sitting at a cafe and your friends haven't joined you, you're waiting to 
purchase something at a store, right? You can launch an Angry Birds attack on somebody, or you can, you can find out what the latest news is, or you can find out what your favorite sports team has done, or whatever. Um, and so the information snacking is now a really pronounced part of the mobile environment. That's, that's interesting. It's changed the way people share their attention. Um, and then, uh, again, sort of the mobile environment elevates this capacity to search for whatever we want um, very quickly. And it means that organizations now um, have an obligation or certainly are well, um, serve themselves well if they prepare for these encounters with people that people initiate. You're not just telling them what you think matters when you think it matters to them, you, you are available in a 24 hour, seven day a week environment where they're gonna search for you when they want and sort of every encounter with them is, is, is an important conversation. You're, you're, you're essentially in a job interview every day with your, with your social media networks. And I'll just go over that. Then I'm gonna do one more quick thing on social media then we're gonna have a little break here. Uh, the third revolution, so first is broadband, second is mobile, the third is social media itself, which I, I sort of stands out as a separate revolution. We discussed it as part of broadband, people can contribute, but it's changed so much the character of people's networks and how they rely on them, you know, because their networks are really important now to help them find information. These are age data and these are time series data about how, you know, social networking wasn't much in 2005. And now it's 92% of people who are age 18 to age 29 uh, use social media. But even older folks, 38% of the internet users who are 65 and older in the United States have a Facebook account. And they think it's like magic. You remember when you filled out your Facebook account, right? And you said where, where you worked, and you said where you went to school, and you said where you grew up, and you talked about the companies where you used to work. And it, Facebook started serving up to you all the names of people who had filled out similar information in their profiles, right? And well, old people, this is like amazing to them because they're finding people from 30, 40, 50 years ago in their lives. And they, this is enchanting to them. It's restorative to them. I was telling um, American religious broadcasters, there's a very active, particularly in the Christian community, religious broadcasters, um, uh, they meet a lot and they dominate in, in the airwaves of many radio stations. So I was describing this magical part of, of uh, social media for older folks and one of the broadcasters in the back of the room stood up and said, it's just like the resurrection. <laughs> Just like, you know, Jesus coming back to life. <laughs> um, and I said, yes, that's exactly right. I was, I'm a social scientist, so I was going to call that latent ties. But resurrection ties is a much better phrase for them. So thank you very much. And when these social networks um, in, in, are, are portrayed in technological spaces, first of all, we have, we, we have we're contact with more people than our ancestors were, right? They're not necessarily friends. They're not necessarily even important acquaintances. But it's just so easy to keep updating your status and read their material on your news feed that you can just watch more people all the time. So we are in contact. Uh, the, the ex we, we've got a bigger social universe than our parents did or our grandparents did. Also, our networks have become much more segmented, right? If you think about your own Facebook networks, you've got some people who are you know, educational friends, and some people who are professional friends, and some people who are health friends, and some people who are neighbors, and they don't necessarily know each other. In the village world of long ago, everybody knew everybody else, and everybody knew you. And so they'd all be talking to each other. Well, now the professional friends of yours don't necessarily know your neighbor friends. And so this is another way that networks have really changed and segmented in our world. They're important to us. We have different relationships with them, but it, it, in a network world, you have to work pretty hard to get your needs met. You can't just count on the, your tight family or your tight village to be your safety net, right? You've got to ask for help. You've got to tell your network, I, I need this information to make a decision, or I have this need that I want fulfilled in my life. So it's a very different way that we're using our, our networks. There's a lot of um, self-learning and do-it-yourself learning that goes on in networks. So yep, 
com companies still matter uh, to help curate and help people navigate in these spaces, but we're teaching each other a lot in these networks. And again, sort of thinking of your own um, experiences, I'm sure there are times when you just wanted to figure something out. Something was going on in your home or something was going on at work and you sent off a little note saying, well, I don't understand this or What's, what do you make of this? And, and some of your friends were responding to you. So we, we, we now, our friends have become teachers of us just as we've become teachers of each other. Uh, amateur experts now sit next to credentialed experts and helping people navigate information spaces and learn things. Um, and and this, point, this wonderful point um, that you made before, institutions are now acting like friends in networks. So they are playing the same role in many cases as, as, um, as friends in networks. Um, and, and so those are, those are, that's, those are the big points that I wanted to make about those three revolutions. And uh, why don't we take a few questions now and have a little break. Um, and then you can hear the Israeli version of this story. Are there any questions about those revolutions? No? So we just, yeah. I mean, what do you do? I mean, the other part, and which was mentioned over there, with uh, there's a talk nowadays with the, infor uh, the, the information diets. Yes. There was a, um, just a, I think it was published today about um, the decrease of um, in between youth of uh, Facebook use because they're taking advantage a lot about the increasement of the use of mobile and pushing a lot of advertising over there and also into the feed. Yeah. Um, yeah. What? What? Well, people what are some of the solutions because you know what what's happening nowadays and a lot of it we're talking about filter bubbles and other problems and what right. are some of the solutions. Um. Well. Uh, I will, I'll be brief on solutions because maybe we can talk a little more about this and there is sort of an Israeli version of this story that's important to know. Um, a couple of things. When people are challenged in an information overload environment, they do depend on their networks more to help them figure out what's new in the first place, to help them evaluate new information when they've encountered it, and to act like sounding boards to give them feedback when they are promoting something in social media. So one of the ways that people are coping in this new environment is to depend more on their social network. So one solution is to make sure that your network is nice and diverse. You've got a big network and you've got a diverse network. Because the more different points of view, the more far-flung the information is that can get to you, the better off you are. If you live in a little info bubble and everybody you hang out with is exactly like you, you're not going to learn about the best new jobs. You're not going to learn about the direction that your industry is going. You're not going to learn about news that doesn't get fed through you know, your tight-knit network. And so to stay on top of things, diversify. Okay, I have a lot of different people from different generations, from different socioeconomic classes, from, uh, from uh, different racial groups potentially, and, and things like that. So diversify. That's, that's definitely one solution. The second thing is to, is to make sure that you know all of these problems. So you know that there is a filter bubble. You know that there are ways that people have a tendency just to narrow their information universes. So make sure that you're f discovering new stuff as you go through your information searches. Just make sure that you're not all you know, um, uh, listening to the handful of people who claim to know everything about something or the handful of institutions that might have an answer. Just make sure that you're diversifying and touching um, all bases. Um, for companies, um, there isn't any great solution now because it's a world that's in flux. So the best company solution that you know, I talk to American companies about <laughs> is to be available every place you possibly can be because you never can tell. I mean, Facebook might be s slowing down a little bit in, in terms of use by young people. It's still the dominant social media platform. You can't not be available on social media if, or, or on Facebook in particular if you want people to learn about your company or people to learn about things that, that about your products and services and things like that same thing with mobile uh, you just you know i'm sure there's a very advanced community of designers and here that, that do responsive design that make sure that when you promote when you've got information to promote you you make it available on all these screens because you never can tell when people are going to make a pathway to your door if you had to place your bets, you know, you can't do it for everybody and you can't make it, you don't have the staff or the resources to make it available on every screen. Yeah, the trend is toward mobile. The, the trend is toward smaller screens. The trend is, is 
is towards social. But it's, you know, it's in many cases, people, I know there's a lot of evidence here that people rely on different platforms for different sources. You know, there's one place that they go for their weather advice, and it's different from the place that they go about where, where the best uh, shops are in town or where the best restaurants are, and it's different still where they get political information. So it, depending on what news or what information you want to hand to people, understanding what platforms they use for that is probably the right one, but it's different for different people. Old folks have a different news diet from young folks. Uh, so sorry, it's just a confusing world. <laughs> a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, First off, what, what you just said, as, but is there a trend? Because um, I can I can probably think that it'll be in, mostly on Facebook. But you're saying that people are using in different platforms in different ways. Are there you no know, dominating trends, or are we talking about um, a mess? Yeah, it's it, well, it's a mess for sure. There are there are some. I mean, voice communication now is is sort of less prevalent than text communication. Especially for young people in America, they privilege text over 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 voice. Um, the trend is towards people segmenting even their social media environment. So they use face when their mom's on Facebook, they'll still use it for certain things, but they won't use it for other things, right? And so they might move over to Twitter. Sorry. Well, they might create another account. They might stay in Facebook, but they'll create another account and they'll only let their friends know because they don't want their mom to see. Right? You can segment your mom. That's right. You can segment your mom. You can just block her out of all of the stuff that she doesn't know she's not seeing anyway and, 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 and things like that. Um, it, it, mobile is definitely you know, a, um, a, a big trend and, and social TV is, a, is, is sort of getting its, its attention in America. It's a couple of years off, but eventually the, you know, the big screen television experience is going to be an internet experience. It'll be more like apps rather than uh, TV stations. Well, when you're talking social TV, you mean uh, in terms of apps or... Yeah, uh, yep, or yep. Or in terms of... Uh, sense of TV Netflix TV? Or, or Hulu uh -huh. or, uh, or something like that. So your TV screen will be a lot more interactive. Mm -hmm. you, it won't just be station, TV stations. It'll be a, a combination of some TV, some... Um, uh, online video, some app type experience that's an augmented reality experience. Some, kind of some, feed. Sorry? some kind of feed. Yeah, some kind of, yeah. And it will it'll all, you know, we'll all be doing multiple things. I mean, that's the other thing that's a, a big um, trend in, in media is that people doing multiple screens, you know, so they are watching a TV show, but they're commenting like crazy in Facebook or, or Twitter about it, or they're texting to their friends about it. So, so it's in many respects what's what's happened is, is platforms have have spread out and, and companies are just having to keep up with that because it's not like people are throwing their TV sets away and only looking at computers. That's not happening. But can you say, for instance, I know Pinterest. Uh, when you think of Pinterest, you usually usually think about a predominantly a female audience. Yep. But are they when you're talking about uses? Uh, is there? <coughs> Uh, a place where, where I would go, say, so for, for the weather, is there a place where um, most people would go, or? Uh... Um, no, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, there are dominant media companies in the United States. It's the Weather Channel and, and things like that. But what's what's it, what's the the greater reality, of course, is that people have have spread out their media diet so that they go to the best, most useful sources for specific things. It used to be that like the newspaper or the TV yeah. broadcast would give you, you know, nine different topics and it would try to be great at all of them, right? It would tell you what's going on in sports and the weather and local news and local politics and tra it, well that bundle has blown up, right? Because now you can get the best information about sports, not from the local newspaper or its website, but from these fabulous sports sites that do nothing but sports every hour of the day, every day of the year. And so people are unpacking and, and sort of reassembling. I mean, it's so, so there are ways now that in the apps environment or in, even in the RSS environment, people are reassembling the bundles. But so I would find the first movers or at least the dominant actors in each of the, each of the areas where you, know, you think your information has a place. The other thing, of course, that's happening is that customized you know, uh, in the behavioral advertising environment, 
don't be thinking in demographics anymore. You're not necessarily thinking of women who are a certain age and live in a certain community. You're looking at who who is in, interested in your subject, regardless of what their gender is, gender is or regardless of where they live. So psychographics now matters much more, and it's actually much more. Psychographics, it's, it's what's going on in your head. Um, how, how do you determine that? You, you can tell from the ad networks and, the, and you know, what, what Google and Facebook tell you about who users are. Do you, you know you can do this, right? You can go to Google and say, what does Google know about me? You, you can just type in that query, what does Google know about me? And if you have any kind of a Google account, it will take you to a page where it tells you who it thinks you are. And it, and, and it by demographics. It, 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 so it will tell you what gender, uh, roughly what age, and it will start listing all of the subjects that it thinks you're interested in, which is much more relevant to Google. It, uh, you know, I do a lot of crossword puzzles, and, and I look up answers I can't find for crossword puzzles with Google searches. Well, Google, the first thing it says I am well, is a word puzzle. Yeah, yeah it's a word puzzle freak. But it also thinks I'm a 70-year-old woman. I don't know why, uh, but you will find. And you know what Google's answer to that is? <laughs> That's right. Um, Google's answer to that is it doesn't so much care whether it's got the gender or the age wrong on you because you act like that person even no matter what your gender, your gender and age is. So they're like there are women in my office. Pew does just a you know ton of public policy and news related research, right? So everybody, man or woman, in our office is a complete news junkie, right? So there's a 45 year old woman in my office that Google thinks she's a 72 year old man because she has the same profile of, his, of that news junkie. And, and she had Google people in our office just yelling at them for, a, you know, for about a half an hour. And they said, actually, we don't care that we don't have your age and exactly. gender, right? Because we know you're interested in news. And that's what we're selling to advertisers. Yeah. Um, you talked about uh, a bubble or sort of a filter bubble and also about uh, um, people like using Twitter that are uh, opinion makers or yeah. opinion shapers. Yeah. I think uh, sometimes this bubble can uh, uh, create sort of an illusion because what happened here in the last elections that we had a, a small new uh, party that did a lot of noise on, on social media. And yeah. everybody was talking about like if the elections this time will be on Facebook and on social media. And these guys were social media uh, professionals, yeah. okay? Yeah. So they did a lot of noise, and before the elections, everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people were sure that they're, what, they're gonna be, be, they're gonna be elected to the right. next or almost, and right. when the real results came, right. they were so far from that. Yeah. Yeah. Because real people, most of the people, not you know, yeah. in this bubble yep. of Tel Aviv, uh, uh, yeah. uh, opinion <laughs> shapers, makers, yeah. which is, you know, they, they didn't know about them. Well, that's the mistake. And we surely didn't choose them. So what I'm asking is that sometimes this, all this kind of idea that you know, social media is so democratic and leads the way, or, or you know, uh -huh. sometimes creates some sort of illusion. I think. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't and really represent the whole public. Right. Um, th that's exactly true. Um, and the mistake that we all make is is often by thinking that whatever we observe around us and whatever our friends are talking about, that's the, the reality of the world. And there are you know, classic examples going back generations of people making that mistake. So it's not new to the era of social media. What is true about social media is people are over-predicting its, its predictive capacity. But, you know, Twitter users are a pretty um, unify, uh, the, the sociological term is homophilous, right? They're pretty much like-minded and they're pretty socioeconomically like each other and they've got very similar um, political views. So even though if there, you see lots of chatter in, in Twitter about something, it is not representative of the broader, more diverse population and people make that mistake all the time. And so that one, one thing to do is to make sure your research methods capture Every segment of society, not just the you know the slice that's doing something, um, and you're right. Uh, it, it, it's a natural human tendency to f hang out with people who are like you, to believe that everybody around you shares the same information. One of the uh, my favorite statistics from our work last year was 39 percent wrong. 51 percent of social network users have been genuinely surprised and shocked 
by their friends' political views. Because we, we, we again sort of think they, they're just like me, right? Uh, they're my friend and I know a little bit about them. And But what, they have that view on that issue or they support that candidate or something? So we're, we're constantly you know, over-interpreting or over-predicting our environment from these, you know, from these signals. It's useful stuff. It, it tends to, you know, it tends to be quite good for giving you the direction of things. Um, but it's, you know, don't don't bet your company on it, and don't bet your political fortunes on it, because it's not, you know, it's not often the case that it's it's representative of the of the broader public. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, but you, yeah, it relates to what you said that you need to diversify. And I find it very hard, both on my own personal level, yeah. and, and when indeed people encounter people that, that we have, um, you know, suddenly he sounds like not the guy you thought he, you yeah. thought he is. You, you see all hell breaks loose in, in Facebook and, and yeah. all sorts of uh, talks. <laughs> and it kind of, uh, you know, it closes in the bubble. You know, everybody from a, from a certain point of view, you know, they close the ranks. If somebody says something that's out of line, you know, even you know the most open, the most yeah, uh, yeah. tolerant, forward-thinking yeah, people yeah, yeah, are yeah. gonna yeah. close yep. ranks. He's not talking the right language. We're yep. not talking, and he's a troll. Yep, people do that. Yep, that's very tribal yeah. behavior. Yep, and it, it, it so all the tendencies, all the tendencies are centrifugal. You know, they pull, they're sort of pulling you in towards, so you just got to fight that. It's a, it's a sort of natural human tendency. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I research uh, online politics and um, you know, I talk about uh, with my students about uh, the great uh, use uh, that uh, Obama made of the web, things like that. And then I take them down to reality and I say, yes, but look, uh, according to you, um, most people receive the political information from uh, local uh, cables. Yeah, local, t yeah, 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 local, local and, cables. And, and television, and yeah. You also, you segmentize it and you look, uh, for example, at Twitter, it's also something like uh, less than... Less than 5% yes. get, get news from Twitter. Yes. Yep, yep. That's, uh, that's reality. Yeah, uh, but... It, it, but the, the rise of the internet has been an amazing story in the past 15 years. Yeah, so, it, but it still hasn't surpassed television. And, um, and, you know, in a way, measuring it the way that we measure it is, is not necessarily giving you an accurate picture either. It's it, treating it like a horse race. It's television compared to the internet, compared to newspapers and stuff like that. Most Americans, and I assume this is true of most Israelis, have a very diverse media diet. They, they use multiple platforms a day. They have multiple sources, so it's not just traditional news organizations, but also their friends talking about stuff. And it's very hard to get people to remember where they found the most salient piece of information or where they got, where they learned material. And, and so in some they, respects... They can give multiple choices. Yeah, they, they, they can, it, but treating it like a horse race so that the internet's, you know, now the winning horse and newspapers are not because lots of the internet information they're getting comes from traditional newspaper companies. Um, and so the people have a, have a blend of sources and they also have a blend of of places of origin. Some of it is highly professional, some of it is the most, you know, simple amateur stuff as well. And and getting people to sort of sort through that is is in, almost impossible for researchers now. But you're right, television still is the number one source, in part because there's so many advertisements, political advertisements on local television. Yeah. Um, I think we are doing this research about uh, quartet and internet and try to figure out what social activists in Israel think about the internet and how they use it. Uh -huh. And I think so far, uh, most of our, the people that I talk with don't see the internet as a uh, state, but the new uh, public sphere. Yeah. The place where they talk with people and they don't think that are um, changed reality through Facebook. They say, no, we just changed opinions and ideas. We're not replaced. Uh, we, mm -hmm. ju we just took the, the public sphere into online, but right. that's it. Um, and second, um, many many people that I talk with, um, they don't say that the internet is flat directly. They say it's an illusion because still, who are the people are, are, are share status on Facebook and, and post status on Facebook? Are the as as we mentioned, male white from Tel Aviv Center and whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's only an illusion and it's more dangerous because we think that
mentioned the illusion about that. We we have so many audience and so many fans, but eventually only ten people came yeah. to the yeah. to protest. So they they really talk about the internet as illusion, as a place when people think it's more than what it really is. And in most of the day, when I see when I use Facebook and I see what my friends are posting, they just do link to the mainstream media. They don't say what they think or. Mm -hmm. just put a link right. and then for so maybe we in 2013 we'll be more realistic about the internet we, we see that yeah. people use the internet as a tool like they use the television right and the, the other thing that's that's certainly true in our countries is that the distinction between online and real life or on you know virtual and and real it doesn't exist for people. They do things in multiple venues. They reinforce each other. They're, they're not separate domains at all. But I, I, I yeah, you, there's always a hype cycle. You know, the, the, the predicted impact of anything go, goes way out of proportion. And then there's this disillusionment this that always follows it. Oh my gosh, it was never good for anything because it hasn't changed the world. And then there's this sort of, there's this sort of maturation of thinking about it and, and, and sort of more reasonable, um, conversation about its impact and stuff, and it sounds like you're beginning to capture a lot of that here. Yeah, it has not replaced old gatekeepers with a, a fully democratic, small d, you know, um, sphere. It's shifted. There, there are definitely now new influencers who are shaping political conversation and shaping political culture who wouldn't have had the same capacity in the old media systems. Okay, but it's it's not like there are no more elites. It's just there are new elites, or there are new influences. But it, are, are they really new, or are they the, the same elites? Because you said yourself that people who, who, who tend to use social media, smartphones, are predominantly white, male, uh, uh, rich, or not rich, but not poor. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it making the gap uh, smaller or actually wider? Uh, two things. Um, it, it's socioeconomically, so their demographic profile is not different dramatically from old elites. But if you actually look at the at the people who are who are influencing, it's a, it's a different mix of people than was true in the pre-internet age. And a lot more people who've got something to say and a cause have these tools now to be influencers in a way that they couldn't when they didn't own the barrels of ink and the printing press. So that so we've. Sh Socioeconomically, they're probably they're, it's 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 a very similar cast of characters in the broadest demographic sense. But if you look at individual actors, it, it is they're a different. Sons. Sorry. Their sons. Yeah, it's their, it's their kids, maybe. Yeah. Uh, that's that, that's. Uh, and they have a socialist a socialist agenda, but not you know it's like the the kids from uh, Occupy Wall Street, you know their dad worked in the office. That were, and didn't pay their college debt apparently because yeah. that was but the other the other thing that's 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 a little bit different at least from our data is that there's such systemic distrust in institutions now that that one way the internet is creating new structures for action is that they stand apart from say standard political parties standard um, organized interest groups and things like that. Yes, those groups still are very vibrant, important, influential actors in this environment, but there are ways now that people can essentially take matters into their own hands outside the structure of you know, the basic power that existed pre-internet. Yeah. Or, or the opposite, when institutes don't trust the masses, when you look at the, the new yeah. online universities, which has a lot of knowledge uh, and they just try to drive it into the public with low cost or no cost. Yeah. And, take. and then the institute, this is what's going to take away from their pose or their grades. And we're still forgetting that most of the world is not connected to the right. internet. Right. But a lot more of the world now is mobile. So that, and another reason why, you know, the, the big grand trend to, to be watching is mobile because it's the way now that 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 in in developing areas they are skipping a generation of technology and it's and it's it's you know that's their ticket to connectivity and stuff yeah uh, two questions uh, first about blogs I know it's not for country talk but you did mention in the beginning that uh, only 4.4% 4, 4 mm -hmm. of US population is blogging but on the other hand that uh, most of the blogging uh, goes on to 
Facebook. So the question is, how are you going to continue measuring blogging if you know a lot of the activity that takes place in Facebook is blogging like, and yeah. maybe in general, you know, how blogging is going to look in the era of Facebook? Yeah. It's a standard problem that we faced, um, and, and probably five years from now, we won't ask a blogging question. We'll ask, do you post personal stories uh, on the internet, you know, and fill in the blank. It could be on a social networking page, it could be on a service that's not even come into existence, it could be on a, on a, on a sort of quasi-blogging format like Tumblr or something like that. So my guess is that we'll, we'll probably refine that question not to be about a particular style of publishing, but to be just generally do you do it? Because what we want, what we care about is whether people are content creators and what content they create. We don't care whether it's in blogging or in um, social networking space or whatever comes after that. shifted from, um, or, or most of the, you know, uh, people who are native internet users, uh, shifted from reading news in a particular newspaper to reading news according to theme. Like, for example, you care about a certain yeah. topic, yep. like gardening or whatever. Uh, most of the information that you would get comes from your friends on Facebook or mailing lists that send you to stories that are posted in different places, not in a particular newspaper. And it seems to me you're talking about apps and uh, the people, you know, download the uh, Right. Um, yep. There, there's a way that they, they, certainly the news organizations are incredibly excited about the apps environment because it reestablishes their connection with their customers in a way that they didn't have during the World Wide Web wired searchable I internet and things. Um, and advertisers are thrilled about it too because you're, potentially your advertising experience is, as, is somewhat richer than in, in, in like a tablet environment or a, a smartphone environment than it was on the web where it just it ads are annoying in a way that they aren't uh, in the apps environment. Um, it's, it's hard to know. I think, I think what I said before is still <coughs> the case that people, and what you began by saying is that people will assemble their own um, palette of, of sources depending on what their needs are. Um, and, and companies will have interesting ways of, of bundling and rebundling and, and things like that. But it'll, it will be probably, um, you know, the other thing to say, of course, is that, is that the, the web development community now argues pretty persuasively that in the HTML5 environment, your web experience will be an app-like ex app experience. And so I think, you know, the general trend is towards more um, personal connections to particular institutions and sources and things, which might be good, but it also means that um, newspapers, like lots of institutions, have to ask themselves, or news organizations have to ask themselves, what what's our single great value proposition, and let's do that fabulously, and let's stop worrying about giving everybody a bundle of everything. What's the what's the great couple of things that we do that the world can't? live without and that we can build a business around and and then the rest of the bundle we'll just have to try to keep giving it to them as cheaply and efficiently as possible. So figure out what your franchise is. That's that's what every institution is trying to do these days. Should we take a break just so that people are faint from listening? Yeah, go, go, go for it. We all talk about selective exposure, fragmentation, yeah. polarization, but you said that Facebook has been around since 1991. Yeah. 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 So how these two sources? I mean, how come? How come? Um, the, 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 our data show a couple of things about this. First is that in social media, politics is far down the list of subjects that people talk about. So everybody here is worried about filter bubbles and about civic spaces and about political, you know, mobilization and things like that. That's not what people are doing, even in Twitter. You know, they're, they're talking about personal stuff. They're talking about things that are right in their um, line of vision. They're not talking about the grand scheme of politics. Politics is a very, very small segment for most people. For some people, it's, it's, it's a huge thing, but that's, that's actually a small group. 
So that's part of the story there. The other part of the story, and I, I bet you this is true here, but it's certainly true in the American data, the most intensely political people are more aware of the whole range of arguments on a subject. And if you think about it, that makes sense because they care about politics. So they want to know what their enemies are saying and doing because they have to argue against those people. And so it's absolutely in their best interest to master the, you know, to understand what the opposite arguments are. So the, the, the real issue for people who care about civics in America is not echo chambers, it's empty chambers. It's people who have arranged their social networks and arranged their media diet so that there isn't much politics coming in anymore. You know, in America in the 1960s, if you wanted to watch television at 6.30 at night, you could only watch news. There was nothing else you could do. Now at 6.30 at night, you have about a trillion things that can lay claim to your time. So you don't have to care about news at all. And, and amazingly enough, there are people who were more aware of the biggest news in the culture in the 1960s than they are now, in part because we've now arranged our lives to you know, meet every need that matters to us rather than having to care about politics if we really didn't care about it. So um, that's another uh, part of the story. The, other, the, the final thing to say, just on behalf of not worrying about uh, echo chambers so much, is that when people encounter um, information that doesn't agree with them, they mostly just ignore it. They don't sort of ban that friend from their life. They don't say, I'm going to not ever read her postings again, or I'm not going to invite her to my next party. And stuff. They just ignore it. I mean, it, and think about your own families, right? They're probably annoying political people in your families. You just know not to bring the subject up, right, when you're with them. You don't, you don't sort of have unpleasant conversations if you can help it. Well, that's kind of the same thing that happens in social networks, too, where if First of all, it's not a big part of the diet. Secondly, if people become annoying about politics, just just ignore them. And for a small number of people, they do get so annoyed eventually that they will unfriend somebody or they'll block them or things like that. But that's not the majority experience. By I mean, it's about a fifth of people at one time or another have done that. And usually, it's not a close, close friend. It's an idiot that they friended for some stupid reason five years ago and never liked the person in the first place. Right. So, is it uh, reasonable to assume that uh, um, as, as much as the country is aware awareness to politics issues, we, we, can, uh, we can see more rise of the, uh, the use of the social media? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, every, it's certainly the American story is that each new election cycle brings more and more use. And the Obama administration... Yeah, the, well, the Arab Spring is a, is a good example of that, too. What, and um, what's, di what strikes me as different, and I, I don't know the analysis on this, and it, I'm not sure it even exists yet, but what I think happened in the Arab Spring is, sure, uh, you know, the, certainly the uh, elite, urban, young adults were tuned into this and found out things that they might not have found out before, and they became aware that there are a lot more people who thought like them. I mean, the big... The, the big mobilization dimension, I think, of the, of, of the use of social media in the Arab Spring was all of a sudden you knew that the, the, you know, the couple next door and the guy at work and stuff, they felt the same way that you did about the regime. And so when they said, let's go meet in the square and protest them, you, there was a pretty good chance you wouldn't be the only one standing in the square when the protest happened. So there's much more awareness now, and it, it's sort of on this point about being surprised by your friends and your networks. All of a sudden, you, you, there's just more pervasive connectivity, and, you, and even people you don't necessarily know that well, you all of a sudden you see their politics are kind of like yours, or their politics are, you know, will, will be... Um, are, are sympathetic to the kinds of things that you're sympathetic to. So I think that's a big part of the story. The other thing, of course, that's going to happen, and America might be the leader in this, but everybody will follow, is that in this data-intensive world, and where so much can be found out about people, both from their social media postings and just from their browsing and apps that they like, that this that that you know the, the, everybody will figure out how to do what Obama did, which is to have this amazing um, profiles on every voter. You know, we got letters in my home 
Um, all, uh, there are four of us who live at home, and, and all of us are voters, and we got letters in our home from the local, from the Obama campaign, not from the Romney campaign, basically saying, hi, Lee Rainey, we know that you voted at this polling place uh, in every election since 1982. You voted here and here and here and here, good for you. And we know that your neighbors have voted, and they told me my neighbors, whether, they didn't say how they voted, but they said, you know, your neighbors, they voted too. And just so you know, we're going to know this year whether you voted or not, and we'll know whether they voted or not, so you better keep up with them. So there's a little kind of social pressure and a little sense that, oh, I'm being watched. I better be a good citizen. And, and my kids were freaked out about it. They were like, ah, they know a lot about me. I said, yes, this is all public record. And so this merger of data and new social psychology techniques to sort of nudge people. It's not threatening in any real way. It's not menacing in any real way. But it's just sort of, we know all of this about you, and you probably want to continue to be a good citizen. And they probably knew that I was more likely to be an Obama voter than a Romney voter. And so that's, this, this, that's the next step where learning from social media is going to be part of this larger data analysis that you know, we're going to all go through. And, and us as consumers are just part of this too. Uh, I, want to thank you, I want to thank you for a great lecture. Uh, we talked before about the challenges of uh, students and teaching in the Facebook era. era. And I told him that you know, I cannot expect my students uh, not to use their cell phones or their cellular or their, uh, their, their laptops when you know I do it all the time and I keep you know getting updated all the time. And I have to say, during this hour and a half, I did not stay to my laptop or <laughs> and he didn't my heckle me or anything, once, which is uh, I think um, uh, which yeah, is evident about the quality of the lecture. So uh, thank you very much. We're going to take a ten-minute break. האינטרנט מגיע לכולנו, 